What I'd like to talk to you about today is machine learning, in particular, how machine learning can be used in, in, in the embedded environment. So let me build up to that. Let me give you a brief history of myself. Uh, this is where it started for me many moons ago in my teens. Uh, I got very interested in electronics. Um, these kind of 150, 200 in one type things I got through like nobody's business and then started creating my own um, different projects from them. That led me on to, you know, the internet of the day as far as electronics was concerned, which is, you know, monthly magazines that you used to be able to get from WH Smiths, etc. Um, this took me through to the more complex uh, magazines. This was the kind of more professional magazines of the time. And I actually started building things myself. Uh, in particular, uh, th this I think was a radio. Uh, many of my things did not work, strangely. I don't know why. But uh, some of them did. And it's just those few breakthroughs that give you the, uh, the urge to go on and realise that you can actually make something interesting. And you do learn a lot when it doesn't work as well, I should add. Um, and then this came out, and this completely changed everything for me. So rather than playing just with solder and wires and components and things I could pick up from the Edgware Road, uh, you could just bang in a few different ASCII characters and have some magic happen on the screen. Uh, while lots of other people were playing games and things on these, I was trying to work out how to do assembly program, machine language, etc., etc. So that set me on a different course, and then th this evolved. We see these 8-bit processors, things like 6809, 6502, um, bringing out lots of different types of mini-computers and micros, as they were known here, uh, which meant that I had to understand this, which is the von Neu Neumann uh, architecture uh, from this chap. Um, and I had to learn all this stuff. Of course, in those days, you couldn't do it on the screen in many times. You had to do it in a, a notebook, on a bit of paper, etc. cetera. Um, actually, when I first went to college, that's, that's what we typed our programs into, using hex, a very laborious process. Um, I wouldn't recommend it as a technique, uh, but it does make you disciplined to write your code right because one wrong step, and you have to start again. And then later on, we even had things like printouts like this. You know, you'd have a trolley go around and you could connect to your micro system and actually print your program out. And then you get things like the Apple come along. Um, meanwhile, um, something else I'd been in interested in was artificial intelligence and its various different memes. Uh, and one of the most important one of those uh, from about 1953, I believe, was the introduction of, or the invention of the Perceptron. Um, by Rosenblatt, he was trying to simulate what he thought a neuron would do inside the brain, and this is what he came up with. It's a very simple um, uh, construction. So on the left-hand side there, you see all of the in various inputs or signals that are coming in. Those are then uh, amplified, if you like, or multiplied in a mathematical sense by different weights, in this case expressed by W0 through to Wm. That is then all added up using a summer. That output, when it reaches a threshold, will either trigger this to fire or not trigger it to fire. And that's kind of what goes on with neurons. It's a bit more complicated than that. Um, this enabled you to teach. So from certain combinations of inputs, you would get an output or you wouldn't get an output. The perception, perceptron itself is actually slightly limited. Uh, there is a bunch of logical things that it cannot do, like exclusive or, for example. But when you start combining them together, you can do exclusive ors as well. Um, so later on, what this became, um, or one other point here, we've got an activation function here, which is just a simple threshold, but normally that's some sort of squashing function. It's a non-linear part of the transfer. Ooh. What's going on? Hold on, excuse me. Disaster struck. OK. 
Okay. Um, so what Marvin Minsky was very interesting in doing was combining these or building on things like the perceptron and building networks of these small units to create what are, are in effect artificial neural networks. Uh, when I was at uh, uh, Kingston Poly, I discovered this book, uh, which is called Parallel Distributed Processing, which is a bit deceptive nowadays, but uh, at that time it was really focused on different ways of calculating things um, with relation to artificial intelligence. So it covers things like Boltzmann machines, perceptrons, and other devices of the time. Then, of course, this happened, uh, which led to the PC. And so for me, that meant writing some of this kind of stuff instead of working on uh, AI. Um, the IBM 55SX happened, which was one that I had. And I did actually return briefly to trying to program neural nets using C++ at the time. However, um, the 55SX had an optional coprocessor, a floating point coprocessor. The one I had did not have this, nor did I have the money to pay for it at the time. Uh, so it was very, very slow. I got very frustrated, and I thought, oh, I'll come back to this another time. Meanwhile, life carried on. This faded into the past. I got on with some more programming. Windows happened. Uh, and then I ended up working in graphics cards, among other things, back with my electronics roots. Those things turned into these behemoths. Um, these, what happened on the micro, microprocessor front is that Intel just kept stepping it up. They ran out of clock speed at some point, went parallel into cores. But what we find now is when it comes to um, working with different workloads, uh, when you start moving over to doing something like artificial intelligence, particularly with neural networks, even these sort of architectures struggle to chew through the numbers that are needed to do for each of those neurons. So this is an example of a convolution neural network. So in this case, the, the purpose is to take image um, pixels or values in and to actually convolve them into segments and then use neural networks to actually provide weightings. What happens is the neural network will learn certain features like a line, a straight line, an edge, or a pattern, or a shape. And these will go together to form certain outputs. So in this this particular example is called a classification example. So what will happen is you present it with a number of images and maybe you are looking for pictures of uh, a face. So it recognizes faces as opposed to cars or something else. So you would actually train it to recognize those things. Um, and this is where these come back in because those, these graphics cards implementations turned into Thousands and thousands of very small, very fast floating point calculations. Um, so that, that is the inside of the uh, Pascal, which is the latest um, uh, engine on the NVIDIA graphics acceleration cards, and also their um, numerical accelerating cards, because they're not selling these into just the graphics marketplace anymore. They're selling it into um, all sorts of different markets to do with uh, high order processing and neural networks, artificial intelligence, etc. So coming back to this, um, I realized that in order to make you know, robotics a bit more useful, uh, we, we could do with some embedded intelligence. We could do with some of this actually inside our robots. However, what we can't fit inside our robots and our embedded applications are you know, ginormous data centers, the likes of which Google, Facebook, Microsoft, et cetera, are using to do their um, artificial intelligence and their machine learning. So we've got to find other ways. This is kind of what we want. Wouldn't it be nice to have a, a brain on a chip that you can just plug in when you need it? That's ideally where we're going to end up, but we're ways away. Uh, if you remember from last year, I pointed some of this stuff out. The old technology is the old traditional von Neumann architectures and then there's the new technology that is kind of crossing this boundary as the processing requirements go up and it becomes very highly concurrent and parallel. 
So what's the difference between machine learning and programming in terms of solving a, a, a particular problem? In traditional programming, what you have to do is you have to write all of the rules up front. That means you need to know what's going to happen up front in all cases. That becomes increasingly difficult. Uh, and it's very, very difficult if you want to use that on something that is in the real world. So, for example, a robot that needs to manoeuvre around a house, avoid obstacles, avoid people, recognise people, etc. It's very difficult to come up with a set of rules <coughs> to do this. For many years, artificial intelligence, uh, there were proponents of the rule-based approach versus something else like a neural network approach and machine learning approach. Coming up with those rules is very difficult. If we look at machine learning, on the other hand, it's a very different kind of arrangement. Um, and I'm going to try and define here what actually happens. So the machine learning part, which is colored, colored orange here, starts with having some training data. Again, it's the old adage of garbage in, garbage out. You need good data to train whatever your neural network or machine learning algorithm is, is going to operate. It's very important that you process your information. <coughs> In the case of facial recognition, that would be a good selection of images containing faces, different angles, different lightings, different, uh, different skin colours, different tones, black and white colour, etc., etc. <coughs> Normally, when you do that, you also split your test data up. You put some aside that you don't train, train your uh, machine on, because you're going to need that to test to see how well you've trained it afterwards. And you can't do that if you've already used the information, because it just recognises it. If you train it too hard, it becomes actually stuck, and it doesn't do its job in a general way. So it's another... There are all sorts of little uh, gotchas when it comes to machine training to do with the data and how you train it. The second part is what's called inference. So here's where you've taken that trained neural network model with all those predefined weights now set, and then what you do is you apply it to new images. So you would show a new facial image to this network in this case, and it would then come out, this is or this isn't a face, for example. Or this is a girl, or this is a boy, or this person has brown hair, or black hair, etc., etc. Whatever you've trained it, to look for. Okay, so there's two very discrete steps, and these can be separated. Um, just going back, how we train train each node on the neural network is we look at the output. It, this is in the supervised learning case, and we compare it to what we expect the output to be, and then we take the difference between what it thinks it is and what we think it is, and we feed that back into the network, so we adjust the weights to try and move that towards the direction we want it to go. It's a bit more complicated to that in a real neural network because you haven't just got one perceptron, you've got layers, so you have to feed back the information, back and the error, using something called back propagation. Uh, and you can use... Um, stochastic gradient descent in order to home in on those errors, reduce the errors and refine your weights. Um, there are different kind of ways of arranging your, your networks for different tasks. Um, I'll just give you a few. The simple perceptrum is there on the left uh, and then a feed-forward network. If you look at the feed-forward network on this example, the yellow are the inputs, green are hidden. They're not connected to the outside world. They're containing the encoding for, for the neural network, the learning. And then the red, in this case, or the amber, is the output required. Uh, some of the more exotic ones are the um, recurrent neural networks on the next line and the long, short-term memory. These have been very useful in dealing with things like voice recognition. So what happens here is you haven't just got a planar set of you know inputs hidden layer hidden layer outputs what happens is you take some of the inner layers and you feed them back in time to another layer and then back in time so you're breaking the network up over time steps because what you need to do if for example you want to do a, a voice recognition you can't just take a single moment in time and determine 
what that word is going to be or who that person might be. You need to take a sample over time. So the pattern is a pattern of changes over time. So the, the learning has to occur over time divisions in steps. And that's what recurrent ne neural networks and long-term, short-term memory type neural networks um, offer. So what, what tools would you use to actually start um, manipulating neural networks? Um, machine learning tools. The, the really good news is on this front is that pretty much everything in this marketplace is open source. I know of very few pieces of software that are not open source in the machine learning world. Um, probably the most commonly known one is TensorFlow, which is what Google use and that's what they expose uh, to, to, to the public. If you want to build neural networks that run on their cloud infrastructure, their image recognition, etc., then you'd use their TensorFlow. Uh, one thing that does stand out in this is Python. It seems to be the langa, uh, the most common used language within machine learning. Um, I'm not entirely sure why. I think it has to do with the fact that it grew out of the data processing. Uh, and Python is a very good language for data processing with things like NumPy, Pandas, SciPy, SciLearn, etc. So all the libraries were there early on. That brought in uh, Python developers. Um, you'll see some common non-vendor-based uh, open source Python libraries, Fiano and Keras. Uh, are both very well-known ones, but quite easy to use, very abstracted, that make this whole process much more easy to use so that you don't have to work out those individual calculating of weights and sums. It's all done for you. And these will have standard network topologies that you can kind of pluck out of objects and assemble together. Uh, other common ones are Torch and Cafe. These ones offer C++ as well as Python-type wrappers around them. But those, those three sections at the top tend to be quite heavy, heavy tools. They tend to be used for these data centers and very large implementations of neural networks. They're not necessarily the most efficient. Many of them do have accelerators underneath. So if you have a <coughs> an NVIDIA card, for example, with the CUDA libraries installed, it will use those to do the calculations and it will speed the machine learning up considerably because it can be very slow to do the machine learning. <coughs> Then if we move down, I've got another one here. It's called uh, L, which is embedded C++. So this is actually from Microsoft. Uh, it's, it's, they, they've written it to try and be very efficient to run on small embedded platforms like mobile phones, um, embedded systems, um, Raspberry Pi, for example. There's an implementation of it for Raspberry Pi and a number of others. And it's quite interesting to see that coming from Microsoft. But it seems to be one of the better ones out there. Uh, and again, you know, it's a bit more lean and mean than some of the others. The library dependencies on those top three can be quite large. Uh, and it can be difficult to put on something like a Raspberry Pi. But if you go down to something like L, uh, you, you're going to get it on the Raspberry Pi quite easily. And in fact, their example on, on the GitHub page for that actually uses ra Raspberry Pi as an example. If you want to go down very low level and just build very simple neural networks, there's a library called FANN. Um, and I've seen this being used on microcontrollers. So if you've got a really tiny, tiny, teeny, tiny neural network, you can use that. Uh, and that's basically just a C library with the hard bits of the weight and array manipulations done for you. Um, and there are many others. There are so many now, it's, it's difficult to keep up with them as they, as they come out. This is a very hot area. How are we doing? Um, one of the problems with most of the neural networks is after you've created uh, or taught your network to do something, you quite often end up with something very large, particularly when it comes to things like image processing. Um, you, you process a lot of data, store a lot of weights. This can really slow things down. Um, in many cases, you're using teraflop type video cards in order to get you through this process. Um, this is a problem when it comes down to embedded or as, as the, the cloud providers would like to term the edge running of these uh, neural networks. 
because clearly you don't have teraflops available to you on the average embedded system. So one of the things that you can do is you can take a train network and you can compress that network down. So you can train it in a data center effectively using simulations or, or just pure data images, etc. And then you can actually compress that down into a smaller format. So when, when you would create these, you'd probably use, you know, full 32 or 64-bit floating point implementations to represent those weights. By the time you finish this compression uh, process, you probably go, want to go down to about eight or nine bits representations for each of those weights, either using integers or fixed point, or I've even seen something called a dynamic point implementation. Uh, and there is a lot of trickery involved in doing that, and uh, a lot of research is going on in order to make that happen right now. So what are you going to be running this? Um, so if you've got a very powerful system in terms of you've got lots of power available to you, you might be using something like the NVIDIA Jetson, the TK1 or TK2 embedded uh, GPUs. So these are the same as the graphics cards, but they're not quite as powerful. They're much more power frugal, etc. But we're still talking tens and tens of watts here to run these. And they will offer literally uh, teraflops worth of processing on an embedded platform. But it will generate a lot of heat. You need big heat sinks on these things, etc. So it's good when it, if it's going in something like a car that has a very high capacity battery. Uh, not so good if you want to put that in a miniature robot. Um, uh, something else that we've seen is uh, commonly ARM will be used as the main system running something like Linux. Um, and then you might add in something to speed things up. ARM does have the Mali chipset. They do also, in their next generation, they are going to be accelerating neural networks as well from an infer inference point of view. But right now, what you can do is you can add in something like, um, if you just want to play with this, you've got the Movidius uh, compute stick that Andy actually recently reviewed. Uh, it was a Dublin startup that was bought by uh, Intel. Inside that little Movidius uh, stick is a small processor. I mean, it's tiny, it's about this big. Uh, that's capable of doing four trillion operations per second uh, in less than a few watts. It's quite incredible. It won't do floating point at that, rep, that, rep, that rate, but it will do basic integer type operations. And it has a mixture of 16 shark processes, a normal processor or dual processor, Plus, it has hardware convolution and things for image processing. Um, most of the applications so far have been put on things like drones for image recognition, etc. Um, and then the other pin down at the bottom here, I'm talking about using FPGAs to do acceleration. So actually, you can provide a soft core that is uh, dedicated to speeding up the artificial intelligence parts of it, i.e. the neural network parts. Um, and I'll give some examples. Um, I, I know I'm showing a lattice ice here. You'd normally use something slightly larger. You can't actually fit much in a lattice ice, but um, uh, they have um, they've even crammed in some very um, simple um, inference for things like voice recognition into these small lattice ice chips as well. Uh, and this market is opening up all of the time. Um, so what are the approaches if you were using an FPGA? So how would you go about implementing that on an FPGA? Well, one way is just to make a whole bunch of very small processes and have them work in parallel. This is very popular. So what happens is they take a neural network structure and they convert it into effectively a bunch of C code running on lots of little distributed processes in parallel. Uh, that's not very efficient. Um, but when you've got lots and lots of FPGA resources like Intel have on their new Altera uh, chips, then it actually works quite well. And they have very high bandwidth to memory. So in the data center, that's, that's a really good way to go. In embedded, it's probably not a good way to go because of the efficient inefficiencies. Um, as I mentioned before, compressing or reducing things down to uh, you know, an FP8 or 9 bits or integer 8 bits uh, enables you to run that um, in DSP units inside an FPGA. So you want a DSP-rich FPGA fabric. Now, a DSP unit is really just a 
multiplier and adder unit that sits in an FPGA and you just want to string all of these together and have memory in between them and just run the whole thing in real time feeding from one section to the next. You can go another layer further. Instead of using FP8, 9 or int 8, you can actually binarize a neural network. That means you've literally, the output for the neural networks is 0 or 1 and so are the inputs. But this is a very complicated procedure. You are losing lots of accuracy and it's still very much a hot research area. But there isn't any easy way of doing this at the moment. And then a, one other approach is the neuromorphic approach. So the neuromorphic approach tries to uh, emulate what the brain does. So rather than you just crunching numbers um, through memory, what this does is it actually sends spikes or pulses of different widths between different units. So you can actually build logical FPGA units that are sending addresses and values over a kind of multiplex bus. Um, this tends to be quite efficient in terms of power usage and things like that. And we'll see more of this making its way into the marketplace, I think, as a solution. So where, where, are, where are we going to use this stuff? So probably the biggest killer app from an embedded point of view right now is in the automobile industry. Um, there is a ginormous amount of money being spent right now by pretty much all of the automakers, plus all of the new players such as Tesla, et cetera. Um, what, what, what are they using machine learning for? Well, at the simple end, you've got PID tuning for the steering. Uh, you've got a simple algorithm called Twiddle. I don't know if anyone's seen that. I may cover that tomorrow in the workshop if people are interested. It's a really good way in. That just tuning a bunch of PID parameters. Um, then you've got things like recognizing signs. So again, you've got image processing here, object recognition using convoluted or convolution neural networks. Um, you've also got things like analysing, you know, the camera information, telling you, where, are you in the lane? Are you going in the right direction? So when it comes to steering, it needs to analyse where those lines are, where the road is, where the convergence point in the road is, etc. But more than that, you have to do things like look at the obstacles, the other vehicles in the road, if you need to do a lane change, etc. So there's a lot of pattern recognition going on there, lots of image recognition. Um, so as far as machine learning goes, you know, this is like a bonanza, this market. And so uh, the automobile industry right now is eating up lots of engineers to actually solve these kinds of problems. And that's not even thinking about the higher level things of do I run over the mother with a push chair or do I run over the five kids if I've got a choice type dilemmas that they have to solve. Uh, what would you want to use machine learning for? Well, planning. Um, using neural Turing machines. So if you've got a small robot and you want to just move it around a place, you can get it to learn certain routes around a house, for example, or around a factory, that kind of thing. Uh, facial recognition is a very common one. Uh, most of the library's been done. You can actually get pre-trained stuff um, from Google and re-implement that in compressed versions, all from Microsoft. Voice recognition I've mentioned. We're going to see voice recognition in many, many different consumer products, cars, pretty much everywhere. Um, Siri, Alexa, etc. Uh, and robot object adaption. So this is teaching robot arms to be able to pick up and recognize different things. Again, trying to write rules for that stuff is really difficult. Neural networks are really useful for this. Um, and then strategizing as well, using recurrent neural networks and long-term, short-term memories.